Um, I'm Dave O'Brien. Uh, I'm an independent UX designer based here in Wellington. Worked for many years with Optimal Experience, but now I'm an independent. Uh, if you're an independent too and you're looking for a new gig, Kiwi Bank is interested. Come talk to me. <laughs> See how quick that plug got in there? <laughs> and Gary. Um, and so I'm, uh, at the moment, I'm a, a development manager for a little disability NGO um, for another week, and then um, I'll be heading into retirement briefly and then coming out of retirement to do something different somewhere else. Cool. And basically, we're here to talk about um, uh, 2014, uh, where both of us went to Cambodia as part of the Good for Nothing program. And uh, our particular project there was to design a literacy, literacy testing app for primary schools for six, seven, eight-year-olds. So uh, today, we kind of like to talk about three things. Uh, first of all, obviously the project itself. Uh, the problem we were asked to solve, how we approached it, what we did, uh, what we kind of ended up producing and not producing at the end. Um, and basically the standard UX cycle of research design test, but crammed into five days. I uh, also like to talk about what we, what we ran into along the way. This is doing UX design in a different country with a different language and a very, very different culture. And I can tell you Canadians are people too. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, uh, the third thing we'd like to talk about is this whole idea of parachute design, fly-in design, whatever you want to call it. This is kind of the opposite of what Penny was talking about earlier, about being embedded in a community and having the design process wrap itself around the community, not the other way around. Um, this is pretty much the antithesis of that. Uh, the idea that first world specialists like us fly over to a third world developing country, do a flurry of work, hand it over, and fly home. Is this a viable model for social good projects? Um, so first of all, a bit of background. In 2013, Stefan Korn, who you see here, Josh Vile from Inspiral, and Sam Ng, uh, organized the Good for Nothing program. And this was a UK idea where they did like the 48 hour let's do this on a weekend, do some social good for some project. They expanded it into a week-long thing in a developing country, in this case, Cambodia. Um, after the success of that first year, um, uh, Danielle Van den Dugan and Sarah St. John, who are pictured here, um, organized the 2014 edition. And uh, we went back to Cambodia because they were so desperately, clearly desperately in need of more help in the digital online space, for example. Um, a bit of background about Cambodia, it's really a study in contrasts. For much of the last 50, 60 years, it's really been hell on earth. Um, during the Vietnam War, Cambodia wasn't actually officially part of that war, but more bombs were dropped on Cambodia, the eastern end of it, than were dropped all the way through World War II by all the Allies combined. After that, they had years of the Khmer Rouge, and then years of bloody civil war. And yet, when you visit Cambodia now, they're pretty much the kindest, gentlest people we've ever met. And it's, it's all a bit mind-boggling that these people went through that and are still these people. Actually, I'll just interrupt there with a the story. So, like, Dave had sort of said, you know, good luck when you go and visit all the temples. And I went and had three days cruising around seeing rape, che checking out lots of things. And my Tok Tok driver took me to this one temple where there was a woman that ran a side store, somewhat like you see here, um, and at, at least 40 degrees and under the shade, and she brought this juice out while my, my Tok Tok driver was having some lunch. And there was this, um, these two little dogs, tiny little dogs, and she was flirting with me, like really hardcore the whole time I was there. Like, oh, my boyfriend, he's so hot, fan fanning me with the menu and stuff like that. And um, this little dog, and I said, oh, where's, oh, what's the little dog's name? And she said, oh, that, that's Brad Pitt. Um, <laughs> uh, and and uh, uh, Angelina's around here somewhere. <laughs> it just made me think of the recent divorce and thinking, one of those dogs, how are they doing these days? Like, uh. if, they're, if they're still together and everything's fine. Yeah, you know? they're, vis yeah. they're visiting Johnny Depp's dogs. Yeah, they? yeah, it's all good. They have visitation rights, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so after, after years of that going on, um, it was a poor, undeveloped country, um, but uh, for about 20 years, it's had relative peace, and that's allowed them to recover and start rebuilding. There's lots of NGOs doing a lot of projects there now. Um, 
One, another problem with peace, well not another problem, another effect of peace was they had a baby boom, just like after World War II with our, um, our baby boomers. 60% um, of Cambodians are under 25. So um, the education system hasn't been able to handle this. Uh, schools are poorly equipped, classes are too large, teachers are overpaid and underworked, or sorry, overpaid, overworked and underpaid, sorry. Um, and one of the biggest challenges is basic literacy. Just getting, it, uh, getting young children being able to read. If you can't read, the rest of school gets a whole lot harder. So over the previous two years, um, these three NGOs put together a program called TRAC, Total Reading Assessment for Children. And the idea was, in addition to some new methods like phonics, they also did testing every few weeks. Now normally they would test once a year or once a term. They switched to this model that after every learning module, about every three weeks or so, they'd actually test. And then for the students who didn't do well on parts of the test, they would give them remedial work and then they'd retest them. So it was very much a metrics-based kind of thing. And as you can see from the graph, uh, track has worked much better than the old system. The problem is it's a manual system. So um, the teachers now have to, instead of administering a test every, every term, they have to do it every three weeks and test everyone. And each test takes about half an hour to run. And it's all done very manually. They were using stacks of paper and then after in the version two, they used laminated stacks of paper and they gave the students whiteboard markers and they did the multiple choice test on these things. And you can imagine after that, the teacher has to gather this up, manually mark each test, manually get all the averages and summaries for, this, for their classroom. Then that has to be gathered up across all the classes in that grade and so forth and so forth. So it became a real paper chase. Lots of transcription errors, a lot of time, a lot of work. Another part of the track program that was a good idea, having literacy coaches who actually figured out these interventions for the students, that was more time and paperwork because they had to coordinate with the teachers. And again, the teachers were already overworked. <coughs> Finally, they had to produce uh, reports for parents, basically report cards, but also assignments that were, gonna, that were sent home, materials that were sent home, they had to be checked back in they had to check that they actually had done the assignments. Um, again, more work, more time. So you can imagine that the teachers, while they liked the outcome, were not particularly thrilled with all the mechanics of this new system. So the good news, and there is some good news here, is that in the pilot schools at least, for this program, they also had Android tablets, really kind of cheap basic Android tablets, and they're already being used for reading apps like this. Uh, and so the obvious idea before we got there was, can we somehow use these tablets to do double duty? Can we do the testing on these too? Because that, that would actually get rid of a lot of the paperwork, uh, a lot of the mistakes, and a lot of the effort. So. Is this a good time to talk about Trojan horsing? Yeah. Okay, so w the idea that I really loved about this project was because I like this idea of Trojan horsing, which is that you take something like a tablet that, that might only get used for one specific duty and it doesn't really matter what that duty is because over time, it doesn't matter if that particular duty falls by the wayside, there's now a piece of tech that's in that school that might be used for something else. So although we might be administering a really boring test that the kids absolutely detest, further on down the track, there's other things that can get loaded on that. So we'll talk more about the hardware spec later and you'll see why there's, there's two parts of this which work from Trojan horsing. And some of it's even at a basic level, like if we can convince an NGO that a really good project is to get a tablet in this particular school, and they say, but the school doesn't have power. And it's like, well, what would it take to get power there? Oh, well, let's get some solar panels. Oh, great. So now the community actually has solar panels and a tablet, do you see what I mean? So you can start using these things, actually start becoming more useful for a community. And that feeds into the whole idea that it's not just the tablets. We're not just designing a tablet app. We're designing kind of an entire system that has physical logistics, 20 tablets moving around this uh, several classrooms, a bunch of users using them at different times. It's not, and it just how this is all physically work. So it's not just UI, it's not just UX, it's actually also system design. How is this actually going to work as a process? So uh, we had five days to do this. There were four of us, Gary and I, who are the parachutists, come in, try to do the work, user test it, hand it off to developers who would be hired maybe three months later if they got funded. And then this is Rune and Jacol, who are the project leads for World Education, a relatively small NGO. Um, and they basically knew all the stuff about the system. They were our subject matter experts. 
and basically day one was pretty much what you'd expect, reading as much as we could about the current manual system, uh, mapping it out uh, from left to right, typical task analysis stuff. The pink post-its are the issues with the current system. So of course, lots of issues to tackle as we went through. Some of them we couldn't tackle, uh, but we tried to pick off the top ones. Related to that, the most important thing we did on day one was, in fact, do an exercise where we did the whole goal setting thing. What are the most important goals of the system? And um, that's important because the top goals end up helping you make design decisions and more importantly, trade-offs during, de uh, during design. So the most important goal of the system was to reduce teacher overhead reduce the time and effort they spent on this. That was the number one thing. Um, and that's where we ran, in kind of ran into our first um, difference between designing something here and designing something there. Infrastructure. There is almost no infrastructure in Cambodia, and what there is breaks down all the time. And we're talking about rural schools. We were working in a modern office tower in Phnom Penh. It had air conditioning. It had mostly good power, it went out four or five times during the week, but it came back on pretty quickly. Um, at the rural schools, we're talking no internet, no Wi-Fi, no air conditioning, frequent power outages, some schools with no power <laughs> at all. Yeah, nothing. Um, they were using car batteries. If they needed to charge something, they were using car batteries. So, um, day two was pretty much Gary and I in a room, a really boring looking Western style room. Uh, with our laptops and whiteboards and the usual paraphernalia. And it was basically us trying to figure out how do we approach this, where do we start? We decided there's so many unknowns here, we're gonna start with what we know best, which is the app itself, the actual fairly well-defined testing process and work out from there. So in this case, the app had to do basically run a test. The teacher runs a test with let's say 20 students. Uh, they then need to figure out who didn't do well on this test so they can design interventions, basically homework for them. Uh, they, they need to go do the homework, bring it back a few days later, and then they get retested. Those students who needed help do a remedial test. That's pretty much the workflow we're talking about. And however, there was lots we didn't know about how this really worked in practice. We were talking about teachers, but there's librarians, there's the literacy coaches we mentioned before, there's obviously the students themselves, there's peer mentors who are older children who help the younger children with their homework. We didn't actually know how, the, how all this physically worked. So, um, beyond the app itself, we need to think about physical workflow. Um, how we're gonna use 20 tablets in this fairly challenging environment. So, uh, for example, the, the tablets had three hour battery life. They're the really cheap, crappy ones that you buy, that you used to buy for 80 bucks, and this was back when that didn't buy you much. Um, and three hour battery life, there's gonna be seven hours of testing in a day, so how does that work? Um, we would have to have had, basically between tests, run all the tablets back to some charge, central charging station with a bunch of chargers duct taped to a shelf, that kind of thing. Um, so we, one of the first recommendations we made was, you need to go buy better tablets for, for beyond the pilot project that have five or six hour battery life, uh, um, if you can afford that, if you can get funding for that. Um, also, as Gary mentioned, some of the schools don't have any power. So what are they gonna do? Are they gonna car batteries? What? So that was something that uh, we just didn't know at the time. And, and then there's all those kinds of things like, what does a recharge station even look like? You know, do, you, do these things, can you effectively kind of link them up in elect electrically in parallel without burning the school down? And like how many batteries or there's all those kinds of things? Like, you know, is, is there even an electrician in the neighborhood who's gonna be able to service these things if even the remotest thing goes wrong? Yeah, lots of questions. One of, the, um, one of the big problems was our users were not tech savvy at all. Most of these teachers and a lot of the students had never used a tablet before, a touch device before. This has probably since changed, but at that time they had not. So we decided that, geez, this is just, hmm, how do, we, how, do we, how do we fix this? We decided we would streamline it. We would absolutely ruthlessly streamline it. We would try to lim actually eliminate as many interactions as we could. So here's an example of um, a screen where the teacher is starting the test, uh, the students file in, there's tablets on all the desks. We wanted to design it so that the teacher pressed one button on their tablet, on the master tablet, and all the students' tablets would automatically turn on, wake up, launch the testing app, automatically go to the front of that test, to the page they needed to start on, ready to go. And the whole idea of that was no user control in terms of the students, they were basically put on a rail and they went along to do this test as efficiently as possible. 
Um, we also didn't want the teacher to have to walk around during the test and see who actually had already answered the question, who was still thinking about it, how many people got it wrong, how many people got it right. Maybe she mispronounced something and everybody's getting it wrong. So as you can see here, as the test goes through, 10 seconds for the, to answer the test, on the teacher tablet, the teacher should be able to look down and get a real-time view of actually what's going on during the test. And in, at the end of the test, two of the students, and she can see which two were having trouble one way or another. Maybe it was the tablet, maybe it was them, but at least they can do something about it. Um, another big problem was the test scores. The test scores are the most important part of this system in terms of data. They have to be safeguarded. There are no paper backups. They're only using the tablets. So um, the problem is after the test, all those scores, all that test scores are scattered across 20 tablets that have no connectivity. So how do we get all the data consolidated in one place? And actually, we didn't even want one place because you could drop that master tablet. You could have poor coffee on it. Uh, it could just stop working because they're cheap Android tablets. So what do you do about that? Well, uh, we decided that the safest thing to do was to synchronize all the data on all the tablets right after the test ended. And in fact, when we extended that, to the, that principle to the rest of the system, pretty much any time anything important is done, all the tablets synchronize to every other tablet on the system. So if one of them stops working, that's fine. You can t pick up any other tablet and it's just as good. Um, so probably worth just pointing out that, so just to make sure Dave's, I think Dave's been clear, but so Basically, the teacher, it doesn't matter for the teacher or the student what tablet they grab out of a box. It, it really doesn't matter. And at, if at any stage the student or the teacher was to drop it or lose everything on it, it doesn't matter. You can still pick another tablet out of the box and, and run with it. Yeah, it was just we're dealing with cheap hardware, and you have to acknowledge that it's going to fail. It's just a question of when. Yeah. Um, the other big problem here was great, synchronizing data. Sounds great, except how do you synchronize? There's no connectivity. So uh, there's no internet, there's no Wi-Fi. Uh, we thought about using some kind of mesh network with Bluetooth, a couple of problems with that. Mesh, ne mesh networking with Bluetooth was embryonic and buggy. Uh, the tablets didn't have Bluetooth because they were cheap tablets. We couldn't use NFC or anything because that just cost too much to add a dongle to it. Um, they had USB slots, this is weird. They had, the, the, they had full size USB slots in these cheap tablets. And we thought, oh yeah, maybe you use a USB thumb drive too. Yeah. So, has anybody ever tried to use a USB thumb drive to transfer data between computers? You've got five minutes, 20 computers. No, this is, this is a recipe for failure. A cruel and unusual punishment. So we thought, finally, the obvious solution was the right one. If you're going to spend $1,600 on tablets for the school, you can spend $50 on a cheap Wi-Fi router. So that's what we did. And I, the one I really like is the, the, like, there's the also the, there's, when we kind of came up with, finally went for the router idea, which was another Trojan horse thing, right? It's getting, a, okay, you finally get, you get a router into a school and you've got this stuff in, now it's like, well, if the internet ever arrives, you know, we can use this. But can you imagine the fifth circle of hell that would be a Bluetooth dongle? You know, pairing now, with like plus add infinity to it amongst 20 tablets all trying to talk to each other. And then, and then there's the crappy tech that that is that might break down and stuff like that. So you, you can, there's other ways that this thing could have been skinned, and it just would have been awful, like some kind of brutal hell for children, you know? Yeah. That, that a brutal hell that thankfully only lasted a week before it broke. Before it broke, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then to be repeated, possibly, which was an even worse thing. Now, we're, we're running down these tablets, and I won't even tell you the brand name, my tab. Uh, <laughs> but... <laughs> Did you hear that? Repeat yeah. it, Dave, quick, <laughs> repeat it. <laughs> my tab should have been the big logo across there. Um, so there actually was one good thing. There, sometimes there's constraints in the system that actually work for you. So uh, in this case, they had crappy viewing angles. You, you know those cheap screens, you have to be straight on to see it. If you're on some angle, it just all washes out. Well, if you're sharing a tablet for a reading app, like with two or three other children, it's crappy for the ones on the side. It's great for you. So that's a bad thing. For testing, this is a positive boon. And because you know, it means that you can see your test, but when you go lean over to see your buddy's answer on question eight, you can't. You actually can't see. So it's like unintended privacy. So that was day two, doing most of the design stuff. Day three and four were about getting out of the city, getting out of the building, getting out of the city to visit teachers and students, actual real users, um, in a rural school. So we headed north about, was it about four hours to Kampong Cham, which is kind of a mid-sized town. 
uh, to this um, teacher's college. And Gary, what did you, you had some thoughts about the, what the teacher's college in Kampong Cham were like. Uh, it's really crazy. Like, I, I, I really loved it. It's, it. There's part of it that kind of feels very much like a, um, like a Buddhist monastery or a retreat, like the fish iconography and things like, it's not really, like a school do you think would actually feature equipment for children to play on? This place doesn't. Like a, it features bits of sculpture, but there's nothing really for the kids to play on or around. So the, we were there for Khmer New Year. So day two at the school, the teachers asked the kids, well, you know, we're gonna have an early day today. So is there anything you'd like to do? And they said, yeah, we'd like to dance. And so the teacher said, okay. And so they pulled the entire PA system out from one of the classrooms and then just put this music on full blare and the kids were just grinning and dancing like maniacs until they were told to basically stop and go home. <laughs> and that, it was just, oh, I In 40 that. degree heat. In 40 degree heat, yeah. And well, we, and we were in the shadows just kind of And the shadows just kind of go, oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, swallowing, yeah, five liters of water per hour, pretty yeah. much. And the teacher's college here was, um, it was better equipped than most of the rural schools were gonna be. Mm. Um, and the students actually, not only were the teachers better trained than normal, um, they were, uh, even the students seemed better trained than normal. So I, we walked in and um, there was a <laughs> seven-year-old boy there who was tiny, and I think his smile was bigger than he was. And yeah. he, um, he, gre he greeted us in English, so I greeted him back in English and he corrected my English grammar. <laughs> so, so, uh, uh, honestly, like, I, I, I did felt like saying, he is Canadian, I'm sorry. I <laughs> Because Dave said something pretty, it was pretty innocuous. It was like, I think it was, it was yeah. just like, how are you? How's it going? A. And no, I think it was just, how's it going? Okay. And, he, and the kid said, I think you mean, how is it going? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, yeah, yeah my bad. Scold. Mm -hmm. So this is our first chance to actually talk to users. Um, so these were interviews we set up with teachers. We asked, of course, we were doing user interviews separately, so we each asked for one te teacher. But Cambodians are really conscientious and really helpful and they like to you know, just be really good hosts, so they, of course, gave us two teachers each. Um, and so we said, oh, oh, okay, yeah, we can do that. Um, this is our first time interviewing in a language that we didn't speak. Now, if you do any inter user interviewing, you know that the answers to the questions are, are half, and usually the least interesting half of what you find out, and the rest is subtext and nuance and things they hesitate over and things they get excited about. That was all lost in translation. So if you're going through a translator, it's really, really hard to do. Um, the second thing was the heat. We already mentioned that. It's about hovering around 40 uh, and humid. Uh, and Gary and I were, you know, fresh off the plane from Wellington, really. And um, we were sweating rivers. I think we had sweated through our shirts as soon as, you know, about three minutes after we got out of the car. Um, and so as we were taking notes in our interviews, <clears throat> we had, I had water running off my nose and dripping onto the notebook uh, while I was going. And I was really self-conscious about this. It just felt, ee, right? Wiping my forehead, the whole thing, trying not to be noticed. So, and I'm looking at Dave. He's feeling self-conscious, and he's got his back to me, and I'm feeling self-conscious, looking at him, looking back at me, going, "We look like pigs. We look like pigs." Even <laughs> more so, like we, we pigs. Look, yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 And then we felt even worse because then we looked around at the teachers who were sitting next to us, and they were wearing. Yours was wearing. A blouse and a jacket. A blouse and a quilted jacket buttoned up, and mine was wearing a cardigan buttoned up. <laughs> that made, <laughs> all of a sudden the session got way longer. So, um, however, we did get a nugget out of that. We found out, we knew the teachers were overworked, and they were not happy about it. But it turns out that they vocally complained about how much extra work they had to do now. And it wasn't until later that we actually talked about it and realized, okay, actually, they must feel really strongly about it because consider the cultural context. Here they are. I mean, Cambodia really has a traditional culture, and by part of that means patriarchal culture. So for them, two junior female st student trainees to vocally complain in front of a male project lead from the big city with two male foreign guests in tow, they must have been really PO'd about this. Mm. Because culturally, it would have been hard for them to speak up about it in that context. So that was a real big clue for us. So um, basically, we went back to the hotel, whipped up a bunch of prototypes based on what we had learned and what we uh, learned from the teachers and from our research. And now the problem was the teachers that we we're going to be testing on don't speak English. They speak Khmer. Um, so the staff at the teacher's college said, no problem, took our paper prototypes, and in an hour had translated them all to Khmer. 
So this was really great because it means we could do user testing. Now this is a bit, again, through a translator. Uh, one of us, again, we asked for one pe person at a time because it really doesn't work with two, and of course they gave us two because they're very nice. Um, so we did it with two, with a translator. Now, um, and you decided, hey, it's just easiest to roll with this. So, um, in, <laughs> in some cases though, uh, word got out that we were doing this testing and everyone else at the teacher's college kind of wanted to see what it was all about. And they also thought it was weird that they had heard that we were testing software by using scraps of paper with marker drawings on them, which they thought I think was A, strange, and B, funny. So uh, they all showed up to watch. So a bunch of observers watching, and because Cambodians are very conscientious and helpful, there was a constant stream of advice coming from the crowd. It was like a game show. It was exactly like a game this show. Testing this UI. So um, the, <laughs> the best part of the testing really was, actually, Gary, tell them about the best part about the... Uh, Which best part? There were so <laughs> many pieces. The best so part th about, th about the teachers realizing. Oh, okay, so that, yeah, but, but I should actually also mention that, that what Dave said about the patriarchal culture thing is really interesting too. So the, the woman that's sitting to my right is actually relatively fluent in English. She's actually bilingual, but felt she couldn't really talk to me in English on the first day. And then when the kids were dancing, and I just thought, I'm, I have a feeling you're understanding a hell of a lot more that's going on than what you're letting on. So I just said, these kids are amazing dancers. And she looked at me and she just said, yeah, they are. And I was like, interesting. So there's, but because there was a, a guy that was quite senior in the school, I think he was the main literacy coach. And you kind of got the feeling there was a, a power dynamic that we were just getting a glimpse into. But the, yes, the best thing about the testing was they were really uncomf uncomfortable and unconfident going through the paper testing and then turning over to that final page. And then they kind of picked up that final page and turned it over and looked at the other side of it and then went back to this side and, and the woman looked at me and said, well, where do we mark? And I said, there's none. You don't have to mark anything. Just, just no marking. Just like double, double checking. No marking. Like no marking at all. Lunge across the table, and you just. I didn't get a hug because I was I was too sweaty. I was just, <laughs> they kind of went. Yeah. But that that was for for me. Yeah, there were there were so many, um, which is why I still plan to go back to Cambodia. Is uh, there was so much, so many good, amazing feelings from that trip, um, and they weren't just amazing feelings for us. They were amazing feelings for other people. And to be able to replicate that would be just awesome. These people are just, it just made teachers' lives that much better. So, day five, that was day four, three and four. Yeah. Day five, back in the city, back in the big city, doing as much as you could to finish up. Now, obviously revising designs, because of course designs always take a beating in user testing, that's a good thing. So revising the designs, trying to document what we did, trying to document what we didn't do, because there were still a bunch <laughs> of problems we had not solved, because it's five days. Um, but basically, and get the project's leads in the room and talk them through we had, what we had done and what was there was still left to do. So um, that was what we could do in five days. Now, Gary and I were both staying longer in Cambodia, so we decided to spend an, an extra day or two creating a clickable prototype. And this was um, important because, first of all, for anybody coming onto the team and trying to learn what this new design is that we came up with, they can just click right through it, and it's a great communication tool. Um, second, for sponsors who are looking to fund projects like this, what's more impressive? Something that looks like a real app working on a tablet or a stack of paper with uh, Sharpie markings on it? So again, this is became a sales tool, more or less. Uh, Chana Che, who was uh, a local Cambodian developer who joined the team after we left um, and who we talked to a lot after the, the, the succeeding month or two, he actually took this prototype and in a couple of days had, had translated it into Kamai so they could actually do real user testing on it with teachers and get real feedback. Um, so at the end of the day, at the end of the week, what we uh, delivered was a clickable prototype, which was kind of a bonus. I was gonna say, well, you didn't mention what happens with the results at the end and getting the data and where, what happens with the data at the end? Oh yeah, oh, go ahead. Oh, I have a okay. nice um, so. So all, as we said, all the data goes around every single tablet. So the only thing the teacher has to do is like at some point, they just pull one of the tablets out of the box. Um, 
in, in fact, even unlike Wellington, it's easy to find an internet cafe for uh, where you buy a coffee and you have free access. Like you can find that everywhere. It's it's easier, better internet in Cambodia in some places than here. So the teacher just has to go to the local cafe, buy a cup of coffee, and the, all of the data goes back to Nompen. So nothing. I mean, it's it's not like it scrubs the tablet. It's like that data is always going to be there because the whole idea was the data capture should only be really kind of CSV. It's all you know, student X result, you know, for question Y kind of thing. It's really really simple data. Um, and so the yeah, theoretically, it, it's not trying to hold a hell of a lot of data even for a short small tablet. And even then, you could shift it, wipe it, dump it, whatever, and start all over again really simply. Cool. The, um, uh, so we have the prototype, we have the paper sketches, we've got the messy whiteboards that we tried to clean up a bit, we had a short video of the design process, and a couple Google spreadsheets, but basically it's a bit of a mess. Here, here, here you go, here's your stuff. Um, and we said, that's okay, because when we get back, we'll actually clean this up and write a proper design document. And that's another lesson learned here. Um, if you don't do it then, there, mm. it's very unlikely to get done when you get back here. You get back to your life, you get back to your job. Um, communication obviously becomes harder, there's email, but we had a constant stream of email over the next month or so, but it just started dwindling and dwindling and dwindling. One of the project leads moved on to another project, this happens all the time. Uh, some new people came on who we didn't really know. Some of the, sometimes their English was good, sometimes it was not. Our Kamai was mostly hypothetical. And um, so basically, we didn't ever actually produce a written design spec. And that's a problem because when you're tossing, excuse me, tossing something over the wall, it's actually useful to have a full-on spec, like we kind of used to do 20 years ago in UX. We don't do them now because of agile and conversation and documentation, but we weren't going to have the conversation with, this, with these developers easily. A design spec would have been really, really useful. So um, I mentioned that it kind of went down to a trickle over after a couple of months. Then we didn't hear anything for another couple of months. And we thought, okay, well, maybe they're just waiting for funding. After a year of nothing, <laughs> we figured it was dead. Mm. A lot of these projects just die. They don't get funding or for various other reasons. It's, it, they're kind of, they're not moonshots, but they're shots of some kind. A lot of them don't land. Then we get an email out of the blue from Sam Ng, who was helping run the tech incubator at the time in Phnom Penh. Wherever I go in the world, Sam Ng is there for some reason. <laughs> and um, saying, oh, hey guys, you know that app you, you helped design? Um, it's now in production. And we thought, what do you mean, like beta to those schools? No, 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 100 schools, five provinces. So it's actually in use now, helping teachers run tests, testing students, doing all that good stuff. And we were just absolutely blown away by this. It's what an email to get out of the blue. I think that's an understatement for, for what seemed like a moonshot for five schools. I mean, to find 100 schools using that was just mind blowing. And here's a few shots of the actual UI. This is managing students. This is the tablets sending their data up to the master tablet. Um, this is a typical question screen that the student would see, multiple choice question. And this is where they get to pick which students need interventions after the first test. So yeah, it's out there and it's kind of working. And the student, the power, the schools that didn't have power, um, instead of doing the car batteries, as Gary mentioned, they put in solar panels to charge these devices. The nice thing is another Trojan horse. It's solar panels that can charge anything. So why not other things as well? Um, what lessons did we learn? Well, we learned that uh, as you've already heard, we should have done a design spec to help with that communication gap. Um, and we didn't have time and we didn't make time for it when it came back. We didn't really do a good job of, we designed this whole system and kind of did all the thinking we could and all the design we could, but we never actually stopped and said, this is critical, this is nice to have. For example, the synchronizing of data is absolutely critical. This screen where they can compare the results of the initial and the follow-up test student by student, this was a nice to have, this could have been version two. There's no indication in the stuff we left behind what's, what's optional and what's core. And again, no time. Uh, finally, the idea that we didn't actually have anybody in the room who was local during the design process. The leads came in and told us stuff and we got information out of them. It would have been really good to have a local UX person or more likely a, a local tech person who was interested in UX basically do the apprenticeship model. Be in the room, soak up everything, learn some of the specific methods like uh, interviewing and user testing. Um, 
join in the design and give some local context, oh, that's not going to work because blah, blah, blah. That would have been really, really useful because then that person becomes the person who knows it when we leave. We're only there five days. So when they, they're basically the continuity reduces actually the need for formal documentation as well. Um, right, so the final question is fly-in design, this kind of parachute design, is this a good thing to do? Does it work? Kind of mixed results. Of the various projects that went on in 2013 and 2014 as part of this project, a lot of them just fell apart. They did good work for a week and for whatever reason, a month or two later, just kind of died. And there's a lot of reasons. Um, we thought ours had died, except that we had a surprise happy ending a year later. So um, I think in that case, I, don't th I think time was the biggest problem. We were there a week and there's only so much you can do in five days. And then you say, well, should we make it two weeks? That's nah, still just two weeks, really? You're gonna need a month or two or three. I mean, you, you did VSA to um, Samoa. You were there? Eight months, 11 months. Yeah. So you need to be there a while, I would say two to three months to actually get in and do what I consider a proper job of this. And a, a core thing is we didn't have time to make mistakes. And that's totally against this whole agile lean type of thing. And, and reality, you're not gonna get it right the first time. We got really lucky that we came up with something reasonably good the first time. And in fact, they still had to change parts of it. Uh, if we had gone in and done a design that didn't work, there was no time to pivot in those five days. So yeah, needed more time. And finally, training. The idea that, that first world specialists like that can fly in, solve some local problem and fly out is, is kind of, it's been written about before, kind of the white savior thing. This is the, it's just an arrogant kind of point of view. And particularly when we don't leave enough training behind, they can't pick it up where we left it off. They had real trouble with that. So this is a, a model where, like I mentioned before, you need to leave the skills behind, not just your deliverables behind. And I guess that, that's the other thing that's kind of, a, it's almost like a sleight of hand. It's like at the same time, we also sound like white saviors right now, don't we? Because the project actually did really well without us. Yeah, we were there five days. Yeah, that project's been like and, a year and, and a half. And it's doing really well. So Cambodia's perfectly capable of doing it without us, yeah. So which is great. So in that sense, I mean, I, it's, it's like any, any project, that, and I'm sure everybody in this room has worked on a project at some point in their life that they've become really passionate about, and you're a dog with a bone and you never want to let it go because you just love it so much. And, and for me, I think I would probably still be in Cambodia right now if I could be. I probably wouldn't have left it. I'd still be there going, oh, right, so now we get to work on version three. Awesome. <laughs> what are we going to do? What are, Dave, what should we do for version three? This is, this is I think, our favorite photo of the whole thing, just as, to wrap up. This is a test going on in a classroom. And I, I like this because despite all the differences in, in culture and history and economics, despite all those differences, when um, you zoom in on the boy standing up on the right, when people take a test, <laughs> some things are just universal. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs>